Imagine it's the year 2001. You survived Y2K, and the Castlevania series just released two of its most ambitious yet disparate titles within the last four years, Symphony of the Night and Legacy of Darkness. What could possibly come next after Konami followed up its 2D action JRPG masterpiece, Symphony of the Night, with a bold adventure into 3D on the N64? As it turns out, the world was next to given a Castlevania experience that is an extension of the 2D gameplay already seen in Symphony of the Night, and this spiritual successor was released on the Game Boy Advance. So how does this return of Castlevania to a Game Boy console measure up? Join me as I answer that question in my review of Castlevania Circle of the Moon. As the prologue explains, the setting is 1830 in an ancient castle on the outskirts of the Austrian Empire. The vampire hunter Morris and his apprentices, Nathan and Hugh, sense a disturbance in the balance of nature at this castle. And it turns out that the whole thing was just Dracula being revived. As he does every century in Castlevania games. The person doing it this time is Camilla, loyal minion of Dracula and also fan of bright colorful clothing. The vampire hunters fail to stop the resurrection, and Morris is taken away to be used as sacrifice fuel, because apparently Dracula didn't quite recover all his power from the basic utilitarian non-sacrificial revival ceremony. You know how it goes, you only get the resurrection you pay for. Dracula does at least have enough power to break a hole through the floor with bats, really strong floor-breaking bats, and then Nathan and Hugh fall deep into the castle catacombs. After Hugh tells Nathan that he can do everything on his own, like your rival in Pokemon Red and Blue. Ah, he treated me like your rival treats you in Pokemon Red and Blue. I don't need you. I'll fill out the Pokedex on my own. The player takes control of Nathan, with the task of exploring and fighting through the castle to save Morris and defeat Dracula once and for all. Until the next Castlevania game, at least. Circle of the Moon is the first spiritual successor to Symphony of the Night, and this is clearly reflected in its gameplay. Downtown. Like Symphony of the Night, this is a 2D sprite-based action RPG with platforming elements. The gameplay is structured and partitioned in fundamentally the same way as Symphony, and you'll find yourself exploring a maze-like castle scattered yeah. with save and teleport points, which the player gradually gains access to through acquisition of new abilities. Many of Symphony's strengths are also this game's strengths. I'll begin discussing them Damn with it. the exploration. Exploring in Circle of the Moon feels a lot like exploring in Symphony. The game utilizes both the X and Y dimensions equally, providing a variety of corridors, shafts, and larger open rooms to explore. Many rooms twist around with mazes of their own, and many of the greater subsections of the castle themselves also wind around in maze-like fashion. This is another huge castle to explore full of upgrades to find, many of which are well-hidden secrets. Plenty of breakable walls hide substantial hidden chambers and passages. You'll occasionally be required to solve small puzzles to advance through areas, but these are never anything too involved and usually present a nice little diversion from fighting through areas that makes the experience more interesting. As in Symphony of the Night, environmental hazards exist, but they're pretty rare in this game and it's impossible to die or even take damage from falling great distances. Nathan's ability to explore the environment is quite limited early in the game, but as more abilities are unlocked, he becomes able to maneuver around the castle with gravity-defying acrobatics. This is a good time to discuss the controls of the game. The GBA's relatively limited button layout is mostly used effectively in this game. Press A to jump, B to execute a basic whip attack, start to bring up the status screen from which various submenus are accessed, and select to view the castle map. The R button is used specifically in combination with D-pad movements to use unlockable platforming abilities, while L is used for toggling on or off DSS abilities, which I'll get to later. The D-pad functions mostly as in other Castlevania games, with movement, ducking, and jumping feeling precise. There are some unique things in this game, though. Holding B will cause Nathan to spin his whip automatically, <laughs> similar to the way one can manually do this with Simon Belmont in Super Castlevania 4, and this can be done in the standing or ducking position. I found it useful for defense against weak enemies or projectiles at times. Uh -oh. Pressing A while holding down 
allows Nathan to slide forward in a low position, which nicely doubles as an evasive maneuver and an attack. <laughs> My one grip with this yeah, game's that. controls is that Nathan's basic walking speed is uselessly slow, and a dashing, which requires an item found early in the game, requires the player to double tap the D-pad in the direction of movement. This is the first Castlevania game that I've played requiring double tapping of the D-pad to move at any tolerable speed, and I didn't care for it. Once the dash ability was unlocked, I never ever had use for walking again, as quite a lot of platforming in the game requires the dash's forward momentum to clear jumps. It was somewhat annoying to constantly have to double tap the D-pad in order to shift Nathan into high gear, and it was a slight impediment in some boss fights in which jumping side to side with the forward momentum of dashing was optimal or even necessary for avoiding boss attacks. Damn it. Double tapping between the right and left directions can be done with determination, but it's not exactly as convenient or quick as single button presses. I truly think the freedom of movement in this game was impaired somewhat by the dash controls. I would have solved this by simply eliminating Nathan's slow walking speed and totally replacing it with the dash upgrade when acquired, so that pressing and holding the d-pad once allows dashing by default. Symphony allowed Alucard to move at an intermediate speed between Nathan's walk and dash that worked just fine. Holy shit. I think a single medium to fast movement speed is really sufficient for a Castlevania game, but especially for a GBA game like this with limited buttons to work with. Next, I'll lay down the basics of Nathan's RPG customization options and the leveling system, which are good to have an understanding of before I discuss the combat. Nathan levels up by collecting experience points from defeating enemies, which improves his stats like in most RPGs. His stats include HP, MP, or Mind Power, Maximum Hearts, Strength, Defense, Intelligence, and Luck. Hearts are the collectibles consumed by using the familiar Castlevania sub-weapons, which are represented here, such as the Axe and Holy Water. However, there are only five sub-weapons in this game, to Symphony's nine. If only the ones they left out included the knife. Uh-huh. That adds up. That's what I was expecting. As usual, the knife sucks. It's a Castlevania game. Strength seems to affect the attack power of all combat, defense determines damage inflicted by enemies, intelligence affects recovery of MP, and luck affects the appearance of items dropped by enemies. Each of these stats has a clear purpose that I came to appreciate by exploring the game's combat mechanics. Nathan can equip three pieces of equipment in total, one piece of body armor and one accessory for each hand. This equipment mostly changes Nathan's defense, but some items also have drastic effects on his strength, intelligence, and luck. I had a lot of fun and utility in modifying my equipment throughout the game, all of which I found as dropped items from defeated enemies. This Castlevania game, unlike the others I've played, doesn't have any money to find or any person to buy things from. Items for recovering HP, MP, and hearts are available, but must be found and collected from various enemies, or from breaking light fixtures. This unfortunately meant that I ended up with a vast collection of cotton robes by the end of the game. Far more than I could do anything with. And it would have been nice to do something with them. I mean, if you have 30 cotton robes cluttering up your closet in real life, wouldn't you want to sell or trade away like at least 20 of them? It's a minor complaint. Anyway, also among the items dropped by enemies are something which sets Circle of the Moon apart from other Castlevania games. DSS cards. The game's DSS, or Dual Setup System, adds an additional dimension to Circle of the Moon's combat. It provides access to unique combat abilities, which the player activates by selecting a combination of two cards in the DSS menu, an action card and an attribute card. These cards, which have images and descriptions of mythological creatures and gods on them, a mockery of man made from clay. Hmm. That's sad. Combined to grant a variety of interesting abilities that can be switched on or off by pressing L. The abilities consume MP and can be either passive stat boosts or drastic transformations to Nathan's basic attack. I even found one action card later in the game which created different familiars when combined with various attribute cards, mirroring the familiar-familiar system in Symphony of the Night. The 
combinations are quite inventive, and I was continually entertained by the various kinds of elemental damage and status effects some granted. A couple of DSS abilities even allowed me to stone enemies, thereby turning them into stone platforms to jump on. It's a lot of fun. This is a good time to quickly mention that this game does have status ailments which can affect both Nathan and enemies. Both enemies and Nathan can be frozen or stoned, which immobilizes you and leaves you vulnerable to attack. However, as far as I can tell, Poison and Curse only affect Nathan. Poison saps your HP until an antidote is used or the poison wears off, and being cursed temporarily disables Nathan from attacking. One of the more subtle things I think makes the DSS system work well is the simple fact that the action and attribute cards required to use it are very rare. I only found around 80% of the total cards in the game by the time I beat it, and I spent the vast majority of my time playing through with less than half the cards in the game. This card. made finding any cards at all Serpent a momentous, card. celebratory occasion, and it was always exciting to instantly try experimenting with new combinations afforded by new cards when found. No DSS abilities are listed in your menu until you discover the card combinations for them through empirical testing, that is, by trial and error. But this experimentation is fun and adds to the sense of discovery when finding cards. The rarity of finding them makes it unlikely you'll have access to the same exact cards and DSS abilities in subsequent playthroughs of the game, and I already have one reason to play this game again just in the fact that I didn't find all of them my first time through. Not all action and attribute cards are compatible, but enough of them are that I had a ton of fun customizing and tweaking them to suit various situations in the game. Some DSS abilities were hugely helpful in places. I have to give special attention to the difficulty of this game, as I found it harder to beat than any of the other three older Castlevania games I played before this one, which were Super Castlevania IV, Symphony of the Night, and The Legacy of Darkness. Not by too much, though. To me, Circle of the Moon is just a little more difficult than Symphony of the Night, and this difficulty is completely driven by challenging enemies. The best illustration of this is the discrepancy between how much time my save file logged and how much time I actually spent playing the game. My save file only recorded 12 hours of gameplay, which is the length of time that essentially cuts out all lost progress from dying since you always start back at the last save point used after dying. In total, however, I spent over 20 hours beating the game for my first time. There were a few bosses or difficult enemy groups I spent up to an hour trying to defeat, and there were even one or two bosses that took me multiple hours of struggling to defeat. I greatly enjoyed most of this game's boss fights though, and encountered maybe a couple bosses which had somewhat repetitious and boring attack patterns. The boss fight against the dragon zombies is easily my favorite boss fight in the game, as this boss fight features a huge variety of attacks and movements that are somewhat unpredictable, and the dragon zombies react a lot to Nathan's position in the arena. This makes the fight incredibly interactive and engaging, and that one boss fight alone just about makes up for any others that are less impressive in the game. At the very end of the game, I level grinded a tiny bit from level 47 to 50 to ultimately take down the final boss, but I think refined strategy and execution through repetition helped me win more than anything else. To keep from being overleveled, I really only prioritized killing all enemies in an area if they were truly impeding my passage, and I certainly never felt overleveled. Later in the game, there are some incredibly powerful basic enemies and bosses to find. Two or three bosses took me as long as six or seven minutes to defeat, which, for a more modern comparison, is about the same length of time I would spend taking down a final DLC boss in Dark Souls 3. I did at times question whether these bosses had too much HP, but I think it's more likely that my growing pains as a new player Please. learning how to play the game for the first time were to blame for the grueling length of these duels. This may be my fourth Castlevania game, but this one still has its own distinct mechanics and feel to adjust to. Ultimately, I loved how this game pushed me with its difficulty. Assholes. You asshole specters. Son of a bitch. Ah. Finding a new DSS card would make me excited, but also nervous I might lose it in some hellish gauntlet separating the place I picked the card up from where a save point was. On more than one occasion, I tragically died and lost a newly found DSS card, 
but being careful let me save most of what I found. This is a game that rewards being careful and patient, and as a highly deliberate person myself, I appreciate this. Even just considering the 12 hours it would have taken me to beat this game without dying, this is still a decently long playtime for a Castlevania game, particularly one on a handheld like the GBA. I was impressed by how massive the castle is in this game. It feels as sprawling as the one in Symphony of the Night does. My playtime may have been a little long because I tried to be thorough and discover as much of the map as I could before beating the game. In the end, I uncovered about 92% of the castle's rooms. It's a major strength to me that even after discovering so much of the map and trying to be so thorough, I still had another near tenth of it to find, totally hidden from my eyes. Like with Symphony of the Night, the many secrets of this game bolster its replay value for anyone who doesn't find everything the first time playing. And that will probably be most people, or at least most of those who play games without guides like myself. The inspiration of Symphony of the Night on this game's visuals is obvious. The map is stylized in exactly the same color-coded way, names of enemies appear when striking them, and both sprites and environments are rendered with exquisite detail. Nathan's animations aren't quite as impressive as Alucard's on the PlayStation, but he's animated at least as well as Simon Belmont is in Super Castlevania 4, which is good enough to please me. It was far more interesting, however, for me to see the many monsters this game had in store for me to stumble upon. About three sprites were reused with color swaps for stronger enemies later in the game, but there are a huge number of unique enemies in the game overall, and a decent amount were surprises unlike anything I had encountered in previous Castlevania games. It gave me mind high. Wow. Others were familiar, like Medusa heads and assorted skeletons. Animations of these enemies were not quite as elaborate as those found in Symphony of the Night, but still good considering the platform. There are a few gigantic and grotesque boss sprites in the game that are true standouts. What the hell is this? It's like a goat demon in SM gear. Environments in Circle of the Moon use mostly darker colors, but splashes of color do appear, and if anything, the contrast between the dark and the instances of brighter color is complementary. Camilla clearly thinks this is so. I found the backgrounds everywhere in the game to be beautiful and immersive, often showing a bit of extra depth into a space. Some of the halls and corridors in the game are hard to tell apart when trying to recall their locations, but the game also has its share of distinctive and memorable regions, like the underground waterway or the machine tower. I was never bored exploring this game, but instead always enthralled and thrilled to see what I would have come across next in my exploration. Sound effects in Circle of the Moon have a nice punch. They give a weight and impact to Nathan's movements with attacks, smacks, whooshing noises when he jumps, and short grunts accompanying these actions. One thing I loved is that every sound heard in the game, even the chime of picking up items, has a bit of echoing reverb that makes me feel like I'm exploring the cavernous halls of a castle when playing this game. The whole game takes place inside a castle, so it's a nice immersive touch. Every Castlevania game I've played leading up to Circle of the Moon has had an outstanding soundtrack, and this game meets the high musical standards set by those older games. The soundtrack is shorter than that of Symphony of the Night. There's literally just a bit less music to be heard overall in Circle of the Moon. This is apparent in the occasional reusage of songs in multiple areas of the castle, and a few songs being a little on the short side. But much like the minor usage of a sprite here and there with alternate coloring, Music reusage was not overdone. It helps a lot that pretty much all the music this game has to offer is enjoyable to listen to. In terms of genre, the music of Circle of the Moon leans more fully into the classical gothic orchestral direction than Symphony of the Night does. You won't hear the electric guitar or quite as much genre diversity as that game. There's a bit of rock styled with some incredible bass lines, however. There are renditions of older Castlevania tracks to be heard here, and they fit right in with everything else to create a cohesive and atmospheric soundtrack. The overall style of this game's soundtrack resembles Super Castlevania 4's to me. One thing that stood out, though, is that it has a lot of waltz time signatures. 
That is to say, songs in 3-4 time. 1-2-3-1-2-3-1-2-3. Like that. I enjoyed the game's use of this time signature a lot. It lent a floaty, sort of uncertain feel to the rhythm of songs that blended well with the mostly melancholic mood of the music to fit the mysterious occult theme of Castlevania. There are lots of minor key songs, though some other exotic tonalities can be heard in places as well. Like other Castlevania soundtracks, these are no average compositions. Expect exquisitely interweaving harmony and counterpoint along with infectious rhythm crafted into well-developed musical themes that evolve in interesting ways as the music plays. Instrumentation and sound quality of the music are pretty nice as well. I always looked forward to hearing this game when I played it, and drums have a nice deep boom that is impressive to hear from a little GBA cartridge. I was impressed by the drum samples used in this game similarly to how I was impressed by the percussion in Super Castlevania 4. Circle of the Moon is an outstanding and substantial Castlevania game that uses the gameplay formula of Symphony of the Night to great success. Its sprite animations and soundtrack aren't quite as magnificent as Symphony's, but that's a high standard and they're still fantastic for a GBA game. If not for Symphony of the Night, this would probably be my favorite Castlevania game released up until 2001. It's an impressively sprawling and challenging game, and its DSS system provides many fun customization options for JRPG fans to sink their teeth into. If you're a Castlevania fan, but especially if you loved Symphony of the Night, this is another gothic castle crawl that is not to be missed. True. True. It is hellish. You can't deny that. You can't deny it. She's right. They are intrigued by darkness. I'm intrigued by darkness. People are intrigued by darkness. Also true. That right there is the most diabolical thing of all. Putting all the knives in things for you to find and accidentally pick up to replace the item, the good item that you might be carrying around. It's a trick. It's a trap. Don't pick up the knife. Always be on your guard against knives. Right? I think Dracula puts the knives all over the castle. Dracula puts them in places. Because he knows they suck. 